Well, thanks, Travis, and welcome, everyone. We have this great panel. I've got to know a couple new people I didn't know. And uh, I just wanted to say that um, I also, as you know, part of my resume, is I have six children and 13 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. And uh, so that's, that's really important that you know understand that. And a lot of them put up with me before my diagnosis, which means that I was a pretty rigid little guy, even though I could do a lot of good things and run a program, even though I didn't know what Asperger's was you know, 15 years ago that much. I mean, we knew what autism was, but we didn't know what Asperger's was. So I'm going to self-monitor myself here and put my little timer on so I don't mess everyone up. And where is it now? Is. Okay, it's already running. So, anyway, so welcome. And uh, you might have this little thing in your uh, in your forms. This is my outline for my little 15 minutes here, and it's done visually. This is a system that is used called visual note taking, and done by uh, what's it called? Um, what's his name? I'm sorry, my brain's not working right now. I'll come back to it. I mean, Mark Twain is the one who did this for his speeches. Of which, you know, that's where I got it from, and another person I worked with in London. Anyway, so what's that first one stand there? The first one there is a little car shifter for your speed shifter for your car. And that, what that means is that shift happens. And um, we had a student at our Berkeley Center who was having a parent meeting, and he was stuck, and he was very rigid Aspie. And he had a lot of difficulty with change. And he said during his presentation, well, you know, S happens. And I said, no, Sam, shift happens. And we talked about it during the, um, his meeting. And afterwards, I made him a t-shirt that said shift happens on it. And our students wanted them, so I gave it to them. But I just wanted to say that that's probably the most important thing for a person on the spectrum is flexibility cognitive flexibility and how do we get that? Okay, so the second one there, a lot of you are parents and professionals out there, and this little one depicts a clearing house and a headhunter, and that's what you need to be for your student. You need to be the clearing house and the headhunter, not the person who does all the treatment or work with them, but you have to find them, really positive individuals to work with them, and I'm sure any of you who have students here today who have had to do this your whole career. You've had to move them to private schools. You've had to find the right therapist. You've had to be that case manager for your student. And you professionals who are trying to direct these students have had to do the same thing. So we as professionals and parents need to be clearing houses and headhunters to find the right things for our students. The third little picture there is what I call as the law of, regress of regression or diminishing returns. And what that means is that after high school, in junior high, parents' and professionals' efforts to be too involved with students actually cause a deleterious effect. So before, before college, your help and your guidance and your strong direction and support and setting things up for them helps them in junior high and high school. After that, it hurts them. See, it's like the Peter Principle. It's just because so you're good at just so something is good for a certain amount of time doesn't mean it's good forever. And so you need to jump. They have to jump from your tutelage to other people's tutelage or to their own self tutelage. And so you have to work on that while they're in junior high and high school. The fourth picture there is a, a woman with a chainsaw and a baby, and. <laughs> It's really not meant to mean that, but what it means is that that's the steel umbilical cord that's tied to many parents, to their student, and sometimes professionals or teachers too. Uh, how much you do for a student and when you let go are, is an art, it's sort of the art of letting go. And if you know Temple Grandin, she had her teacher in high school who was her mentor, who sort of followed her through college and she could come back and talk to her that's what you need to direct. You need to be a headhunter, help them find people like that for themselves so that they can be self-directed after that because they can't always just come to you the rest of their life. And the fourth one there, uh, fifth one I mean is, uh, I would call that let them struggle. And what I mean by that is I had an alumni parent a 
couple parents I did a survey with a few years ago, and one mom came for in for an interview, and she said, the one thing I think you could do better at CIP is that you could let them struggle a little more, because a lot of them su uh, struggle, they suffer from affluenza, too much resources that the parents have, and they give it to freely, and so, they don't have a paper route or babysit or do the things that neurotypical kids can do mm -hmm. a lot of times, so they don't get those experiences. So they need to learn how to struggle. I have a 26-year-old daughter right now who's doing gardening at one of our centers for $10 an hour, and she's just returned from Australia and is gonna get married. She's like, do you have any part-time work? And I said, yeah. And she's getting paid exactly what anyone, any other one would get paid for doing that uh, for a college student for the summer. So she was saying ten dollars an hour. I said, "Well, do you, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, you know." But sh you have to let them struggle, or they're not going to know, you know, they're not going to know achievement. You're going to steal that from them. Uh, the next one is called that's the DM, which is the um, default mode. That's a computer. So we need to understand that the default mode for people on the spectrum, and I'm including learning differences of all kinds when I say that, is to go to isolation. So you can go to go through a program, they can, you can help them and everything. When they start to fail at college or career or with, their, or, or with their own apartment or whatever, they go into themselves. And that's a default thing built into people on the spectrum. It's sort of part of who we are. It's our, and so we have to resist that personally and we have to resist that uh, professionally. We have to teach them that they need to reach out when they struggle and get the help and assistance. They have to ask questions. They have to do those things they need to do for themselves. Because if the Home Depot you worked at closes, you can't just keep going back and try and open the door of the Home Depot. You have to go somewhere else to look for a job. And you have to know the skills to do that because things don't always uh, continue on the way they are. By the way, I didn't, I don't know if I, did you mention that I was diagnosed? Yeah, you did 10 years ago. So my life was like this, very closed down, and it's like this now. None of these centers that I have would have been around if I didn't get diagnosed. Because once I learned about me and who I am, I could start to self-actualize in the world. And I found out that some of my goofiest behavior, like the first time I did this, the staff said, you can't do that, you can't give that to people, it's unprofessional, and everything. I said, no, I'm doing it. I overrode the donkey rule that time. And I did it anyway because I said, well, no, they'll get it about me and they'll get it about Asperger's that we learn visually and that this is something that is unique and we, we're just unique learners. So I'm gonna go on, I have seven minutes left, so I'm gonna have to cut through here, I'm less than halfway through. The next one is a woman getting a massage. And what does that, what's that mean is that you need to support yourself. You know how they say on the airplanes, if the oxygen falls, put it on yourself first and then your favorite child after that? Well, that's, you have to put it on yourself first. If you're not taking care of yourself as a parent or a professional and you're trying to help other people, you're not contributing to them. You're actually taking from them. And our students want a parent who has their act together, who is happy, who is taking care of themselves physically and emotionally. They want a parent like that. They don't want someone who's there watching them at every basketball game and everything and trying to help them do everything. They don't want that. It actually doesn't help when at a certain age. It helped maybe when they were in fifth grade, but doesn't help when they're a junior in college, okay? So you just have to get over it, and it's a hard thing to do. The next one is not the World Trade Centers. What that is is the, the bar graph, that the more that you let go and go on with your life when you have a student come into a program like ours or you have them working with one of these panelists, the more that you let go and let them help them, the better that they're going to do it's almost equal. And the more that you don't let go, the worse they're gonna do. And that's a generalization, obviously. And you do have to, you know, like Ronald Reagan, you wanna make, ensure that their weapons are really destroyed when ours are being destroyed. So you have to make sure that your people are doing the work that they're supposed to do for you. That's your job, to be the headhunter and ensure that they're getting the, the services they're supposed to get. But doing them yourself at that point is, Probably not gonna work. There'll be examples that it might. Uh, the next one is a soda can, and we say to our students, um, use, take a soda if they're having a problem. In other words, stop, observe what's going on, deliberate about what you're supposed to do, 
and then take action. And so that's a little acronym we use, one of our, besides a lot of our other curriculum. And uh, it just helps them have a little focus about, because oftentimes we're very impulsive too about what we do. And we're, uh, we're not willing to accept help and we think we can answer just because we're good at one area that we'd be good at another area. It's just not true. So also, the next one looks like a donkey, and it is a donkey. That stands for the donkey rule. And the donkey rule is if five people say it's a donkey and you're still thinking it's a horse, then don't be a jackass and do what they say. And it's a really important thing that help our students and myself especially to break up our cognitive rigidity because we will not listen and we'll then we'll just go do this thing, we get headstrong and think we're gonna do it anyway and that we can figure it out because we're so smart in one area, we think we're smart in other areas too. And it's just not true. Like I can't be an engineer if I wanted to be. So uh, the donkey rule can also substitute for the D in the soda. So when you stop, observe, when you deliberate, you can use the donkey rule and say you can call your mom if you trust her opinion, and you can call your, your best friend or your brother, and you can get five opinions about whether you should do a certain thing. And then you go forward based on that. And, and I very rarely go over the donkey rule. They used it on me right before this presentation. I wanted to do something, and they said, well, there was only two of them. So I said, well, two of, them, two of you can't qualify to do the donkey rule. But I took it anyway, because I let them, let them rule me. So what's the next one? It's a little station wagon with people saying, when will we get there? When are we going to get there? Uh, and that, what that means is that for most of you, that um, it's going to take a long time. And it's not like a destination. This is a process. And like Dr. McCloskey, who works with uh, executive functioning, says that when parents ask how long it's going to be to take, the answer is longer than you want it to take, but it'll happen just at a different pace and a slower frame than everyone wants. So these kids are going to mature. I was talking to a guy, one of the, one of the people out here before the presentation, and I said, you know, are you on the spectrum? He said, yeah. And I said, you look like you're 25, he's like 40 or something, and, but you, you know, you're, you're mature like you're 55. And that's, we sort of a dichotomy. We're sort of, we have high strengths and, and lows in different areas. So we're in, I'm immature to a longer age, but that's nice because I'm young at heart at an older age. So there's, there's a, pos, you know, a positive to every part of it. I'm getting down there, so I gotta move. What's the next one there? It's the door of willingness. You have to be willing to open it. So students out there, you need to be willing to, it's totally critical that you're willing to try new things, that you're willing to ask questions. That is like the number one thing to break up the cognitive flexibility, I mean, the cognitive rigidity problem. You have to be willing to open your mouth like this guy was willing to come down and talk to us. He just have to be willing to try and find out the information. And people want to help you. They want to help you. So that's what I didn't presume when I was your age. Okay, next one is uh, PCP. Um, that's a person-centered plan, and you need, to have, you need to have a person-centered plan for yourself, which where are you gonna be in five years, what's gonna, how are you gonna get there, and then you need to be able to have put in that plan who's gonna support you doing that, who are you gonna be in alliance with, who, who can you form a, a relationship with to help you. So if you want to have an engineering problem, you want to find five engineers to ask a question about the engineering problem for the roof of your structure. And, you, and if you, before you hire five engineers, you might want to get bids from them to see which one is going to cost the least, you know? So you have to use your intellect to override your social deficit. Okay, the next one is the tulips. And what that is, it means that we all bloom at different rates. So in May, usually, early May, some tulips bloom. In the middle of May, most tulips bloom. But at the end of May, there are still tulips that bloom. And those tulips are just as beautiful as the ones that bloomed in the middle of May or in the beginning of May. So we're late bloomers, but guess what? The adult world is ours. We rule the adult world because they don't, it's not as social, it's social, but they don't sort of pick at you that way like they do in junior high, high school, and even somewhat in college. The adult world is our world. Uh-oh. 
Here we go. So I'm going to finish up with two things here. TKS is thanks for coming, and and I want to say a little bit about the Think Positive uh, effect. So the story of the Think Positive, I give out these little stones that say Think Positive on them. When I was in Berkeley uh, about seven years ago, I was stuck, and I was trying to find a place for the program and do all these things I had to do. And I said to myself, Michael, you need to think positive. And on the storefront, on the sill of the storefront, was a little stone that said think positive on it. So I picked it up and put it in my pocket, and, and it kept me positive for a couple days. So I said, well, I'll start making these stones. I put them back, you know, and gave them out to people all over the world. And guess what? I was taking these stones from this church garden in Florida near my house, and just like 20 or 30 at a time, and, and I felt guilty about it after a few years because they had a ton of stones. But, so I went and found out where they made these stones, and I got a bunch of bags of stones, and I left them at the door of the church with a note on it telling them about how I'd given these stones out around the world and all the positive effects they had had with people who had cancer and everything else and said, sort of helped them to have this, this little stone. So I want to leave you with that is that, you know, if your kid is having a struggle or you're struggling as a professional with these kids, you just need to think positive about it. And it's, it's about the glass is not half empty, it's half full. And how do you get it fuller? How do you build on what the progress that you've already had? Thanks.